So you see, our world is like that. They don't believe in happiness. They don't believe in good luck, redemption. They believe in hell and evils and bad luck and all this kind of stuff. So when the master come with all positive energy, say, wow, you will be saved. Don't worry, I take all your karma and your other five, six, and nine generation. I will also take care, don't worry. And they look at the master like, what? Are you joking? You must be kidding, right? <laughs> yeah. But if other people say, oh, you sinner, you better be repentant, uh, be more ascetic, avoid more pleasure, you know, then you might be able to be liberated. Then they believe that. They go home and kneeling on end or maybe prostrating in the snow, in the dirt, in the rough, stony road for hundred miles on end and to redeem themselves. Even though the whole life they did nothing wrong, just reciting Buddha's names, for example, then they believe that will be the redeeming kind of path. But the Master is too easy. Come to me only, yeah, and I will help you. Like Jesus said, come to me, those weary and laden, I will quicken you, I will lift you up. How many people follow him? Not too many, and they even killed him in such a cruel, gruesome way, inhumane way. He did nothing wrong. He never said anything wrong even against the government or anybody. So you can see, this world is not fit for us to live in. We don't like all this kind of sadistic kind of mentality and the trend of society with belief only in suffering and sorrow and pain, yeah? So any poor master who wear tattered clothes or eat once a day or barely eat uh, once a week or maybe not eat at all, then okay, maybe I will follow you or maybe not even. It's not like, okay, the whole world follows that, then it's not too bad, not too bad. There were many saints who had nothing in our history. In Taiwan, there's also one, she was a nun. Her name was Fu Wei Ni Si, and she lived also in Meoli, huh? near our old ashram. And she ate nothing for a long, long time. She drank only a little water, yeah. And she doesn't even preach. She used hand to teach you, like tell you to recite the name of the Buddha. Her teaching is very simple. But it's good enough. If you follow her, she will have the blessing for your Buddha's name. Not just like anybody tell you who recite the Amitabha Buddha name, but it's her who told you, because she is powerful, she is pure. She's devoted to the Buddhas and the Buddha's teaching, and she lives up to it. She's powerful, she's liberated soul, she's a saint in a human form. So if she told you, even with her hand only, to recite Amitabha Buddha, then that Amitabha Buddha's name will have no end blessing. Then if you recite it, you will really be blessed and be liberated. That's the difference, okay? But how many people in Taiwan follow her? Every Sunday, maybe one bus for or two bus will come there and just bow to her and uh, see her hands and then eat some of her food and then went home. She already has nothing anymore, so people cannot suspect that she will benefit something if you follow her. Nothing. I mean, ascetic to the maximum already. She wear old clothes, tattered clothes, always patching here and there. She don't have any new clothes ever since she became a nun, I guess. Go her clothes always being patched again and again and again. And she doesn't have that many. I saw that. I went to see her also. So you see what I'm saying? There's no end to demand of humans' <laughs> uh, requirements. You have to do this in order for me to follow you. You have to do that in order for me to follow you. But maybe I don't even follow you. 
because I don't want to. Because I like to still eat meat, I still like to drink alcohol, I still like to do this and that. The thing that you did not allow, <laughs> or you encouraged me to quit, I don't want to. That is a problem, you see? Humans, they ruin themselves, they spoil themselves, they do what they want even though they know that is bad. Some don't know, that's okay, excusable. Nobody teach them, okay, we understand, but some know for sure, still don't do it. So heaven is limitless, immense, but <laughs> almost empty. Hell is so tight, <laughs> small, but a lot squeezing in there. And Bodhisattva, saints, Buddhas are all over in the ten directions, life after life. They are helping to rescue humans and to lift them up, but still, life after life, we still have full of humans on this planet. I just hope this time, sooner, we will be only saints, or at least harmless beings. Oh my God! I talk about four beings, right? We only one yet. Only first one, right? Yeah. Ay, uh, you better <laughs> stay until next week, <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. Okay, never mind. So we talk about friends. Of course, friends include bodhisattvas and buddhas and saintly being good friend, huh? Sansusu, huh? Good, intelligent, wise friends, okay? If you have friends in, by your side, it's good for you. But mind you, friends this doesn't always mean they always agree with you, even though it's right, okay? If something they have not uh, known before, maybe they don't take, but that doesn't mean they are enemies, okay? Now, let's go, friend. Oh, sorry, I think I have no time for you today, we just... <laughs> Let you take a rest. <laughs> <laughs> now, the second type, uh, maybe friend has more than just that, no? Friends, sometimes they are not around you. Sometimes they just happen to be with you for a short while, but then they introduce to you some good teaching, a uh, name of a master, and it awakens you some something and then you will go and find more of that teaching or that master. These are also friends, yes. And uh, we have also invisible friends, yes, like the angels who protect you. If you're good, more angels protect you. If you're not even an angel around, they cannot do anything, or they just disappear. They're not allowed to help you when you're not worthy. If you keep the five precepts alone clearly, then okay, at least have five angels, okay? And you have also, not just angels, but protectors. If you're more worthy, you have protectors. Yes. When you retreat, you have more protectors. Yes. When I am in retreat, I have more protectors. But now they use only uh, OU protectors, not the ordinary one. Ordinary one also hang around. But the OU, the Oscar goddesses, they came. Every time, just two days. Every group, two, two days only. It depends on my retreat. If it's less troublesome, then they give me maybe twen twenty-six, okay? Normally twenty-six is around, but twenty-eight or thirty or plus. It depends on how rough uh, the subject of my retreat at that time. Then I have more or less of protectors. The protectors, they know everything. They can tell me many things, just sometimes I don't have enough time to listen. Too busy, busy outside thing. Yeah. Sometimes I know too late. Yeah. But it doesn't matter. I'm okay. Yeah. Should be okay. <laughs> now there are another group of people. They are neutral. Okay. They no harm to you, and no good to you. Yeah. Sometimes they could help you, a little bit of small things, but they don't harm you in any case. Okay. So sometimes you work with them, you feel less effective. But these people, at least they don't harm you, eh? Mm. So, so we don't have much to talk about these people. They can hang around you or not hang around you, but it's just maybe decoration or just harmless, just to have company or something, but nothing much going on. 
but nothing bad, okay? Yeah. Of course, if they are around and sometimes you need something, they can also lend a hand, yeah? And slowly, life after life, they do that. They become your friend in the end, sometime in your journey, if you are still here. If you liberate it, then of course not. And these people who help you, we will also help to be uplifted to some degree. Huh? So not much to talk about these neutral people. We call them neutral. And now we talk about enemies. Enemy has two types. Outside your circle, enemy, and inside your circle, enemy, we call secret enemy. Because these enemies you can't suspect. The enemy outside, of course, they do things very obviously against you or, or bad for you, yeah, or you don't get on well with them, you have often trouble understanding each other or working with each other. They could kaput some of your project, yeah, or your enthusiasm, your ideas and all that. Yeah, that's very obvious and they're not friendly to you. This is easier to deal with. You can escape if you know. If you can, yes. Or if when the time comes, they leave you. Secret enemy is more difficult. They are with you all the time. Either family members or workers together in your company or your workmates or your friends, so-called friends. They seem to be with you in a lot of things, harmless things, small things, which doesn't destroy you, which doesn't ruin you. But when it comes to some big thing, boom, then they turn against you very quick, and you have no time to even counteract. They may join your group or your company or your volunteer group even, and just looking like they're very, very, very diligent and very supportive. But no, they do things to harm you. They split the togetherness in your group by some words some action, a leading people go against you, but no one notice, slowly, slowly, or big, yeah, or quickly. It depends on situation. And they also ruin your reputation, your name, your company, your business, your ideal, your faith. They make you even don't want to practice anymore. These are worst enemy. They could be your girlfriend, your wife, your husband, your boyfriend. Capish? Maybe they follow you in the same faith, look like, but in some way, visibly or invisibly, they slowly wear you out of your faith as well, by their own example, their own action, or their own argument. They make you lose your way. These are the worst enemies. They make you lose your faith. These are the worst enemies. Mostly they are secret enemy because they're with you. You trust them. That is the problem. If they're outsider or they just come and go, then okay, you hear there and you forget tomorrow. But if they're with you every day or often, then their influence are not to be overlooked. You must use your wisdom, your intelligence to discriminate between friends and enemies. Otherwise, your life will be in trouble. We have only one life here now that we know. Next life, we don't know. We don't know if we are still human, if we see a master or not, if we can practice or not, or if we have more family members obstructing us, more bad enemies obstructing us, or we will become animals, or some gods, or some fairy in heaven enjoying too much and don't want to practice anything. Some heaven, it just too low and just give you enjoyment. You have no motivation, no push to go higher. Hmm? In every group, they are prone to be one enemy like that. Mostly, in most groups, there will be one. And you have to be really be vigilant. In our group also, we have. So I have to keep trimming it, okay? For your sake as well. I will not abandon them if they don't do anything bad for others outside in the society, if they still are vegetarian, uh, meditation, off and on, okay, fine. But they should not be near you, because they will give bad influence, okay? By their action, by their talk, by their invisible influence, by energy, yeah? 
Therefore, I'm trimming, trimming, trimming. Okay, huh? Please don't criticize me. Okay? It's getting smoother now. I often talk now without any bad interruption recently, and I'm very grateful for that. And I'm also glad for you. Okay? Mm. The enemy, the outspoken one, the one that lives by your neighbor next door or uh, the one in your company, you know, they talk sour about you or sarcastic about you. All that stuff is not much, okay? You go home, you forget them. Maybe still angry or upset a little bit, but they don't harm you as much as the secret enemy. Because the secret enemy, they can destroy you without you even knowing. And then they make you ill also. And the worst thing is that they make you lose your belief in the right path to follow, right master to believe in. That's the worst thing you could encounter. Or just like Devadatta, he always tried to obstruct the Buddha to teach others. He didn't want anybody to follow the Buddha for liberation. Not only he jealous with the Buddha's fame, not that the Buddhas even care about anything, just his job, his mission, his destiny to be an open Buddha like that, to teach others according to his vows and his power. Not that he cared to be famous. If he cared to be famous, he would have uh, be, go back to be a king, have so many servants, many concubines, beautiful, most beautiful women around him. They select, you know. If you're a king, they select all the best-looking women in the country, young, maiden, to be at your side for your pleasure, to uh, lessen your stress, to bear many children, to enlarge the royal household so that you can use these children to uh, solidify your power or to solidify friendship, support, from neighbor countries. This is like a job also. Having many women also like a job. <laughs> the king might not even like it. Not every man like many women. Most men very faithful. One woman is good enough for him. Yeah, and then they build up their relationship together and they have not just uh, like desire for each other, but they have obligation for each other, they have respect for each other, they have things in common and go together on the life journey as a best friend. So most men, if they found a good woman, and trustworthy and nice to him, faithful to him, then he's happy all his life. He don't even look at anybody else. In America, they make a survey that 90 plus percent of American, USA, yeah? American men are very respectful and loving to their wives, really love their wives and respect their wives. I think everywhere it was almost the same. They just didn't do the survey in Taiwan. The myth about men love many women is not really true. Some maybe, yeah, some maybe, but not all men are like that. I saw it around me all the time, yes. I don't know, I, maybe I told you this story already, but. I could tell you again, and you pretend you didn't really listen before, huh? <laughs> uh, I was in Spain, and I went to a, a restaurant to eat, because they have a vegan uh, taco. Taco is a special Mexican food, yeah? They wrap it in a crispy corn chapati-like, yeah? And it's very delicious, yeah? yeah? They make it vegan. I love Mexican food. <laughs> Whenever I'm in Mexico, I, I really have to go out and find some real Mexican food, vegan, to eat. And sometimes I made it at home, and now I don't have time to even eat, not to talk about make it myself. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer to cook. Yeah, I like to cook. It's like an artistic expression also, you know? You put a lot of color things, you arrange and stuff, and then you put enough space and condiment, and it suits your palate, and after you're done, you enjoy it. It's like a, it's like a gift from heaven and earth, yeah, from your talent and your, your love and the love of all the food that offer it to you. You feel grateful. 
and it's also your own creation, so you feel very satisfied, even you don't eat a lot of that. And sometimes you go out, eat a lot, but you don't feel like satisfied. That's the problem, okay? Because it's not love that put in there. I keep telling the kitchen to put love, you know, like in Sihu, to put love in the food, so it would taste good.